Hi, I'm Marco Flores and you are watching Purebred Reds, Adelaide United Fan TV. G'day guys and welcome to the Pure Red Reds Adelaide United Fan TV. We're in the studio today to preview our clash against Central Coast Mariners on Sunday in round 11. And I'm joined by a very special guest this week, arguably the state's most successful coach of all time and a highly respected man from a uh, very well-regarded footballing family here in South Australia, Mr. Joe Mullen. Joe, fantastic to get you in the studio. Uh, been Hounding you down for a few yeah. weeks now, but uh, you're, you're highly pressed for time. Um, tell us what you've been up to since uh, the Campbelltown season ended, the, the very fantastic year that you had, obviously, um, to cap off a fantastic era that you spent at the club. Um, you now got a bit of uh, time on your hands away from football. How's it all sort of going for you? Yeah, well, thanks for having me, first of all, and good luck to Adelaide United um, in their game this weekend. Um, Ellis, I got a full-time role as well, so yeah. I'm full-time employed by Toyota Finance, and uh, so football and football coaching for me is really um, a part-time piece of work that I do, and I do it because I love it. I've always been involved with the game. Uh, first of all, of course, as a player, and then uh, now as a uh, as a coach. But uh, it is part-time, so there's a bit of a bit of downtown a uh, downtime now uh, from football, but. Uh, my job is keeping me very busy at the moment. Uh, it's a lot of travel that I don't do when I've got football. I try to put it off. And these last six weeks have been hectic in, in travel uh, across the region that I cover, South Australia, Northern Territory, and of course head office in Sydney. So I've been busy enough to uh, do my real job. What a hectic year it's been for you. Um, now, obviously uh, you've got a lot of connections to Adelaide United. Uh, not only is Daniel Mullen, your son, a, a legendary player of the club, um, but uh, you're also the inaugural youth team coach as well. Yeah. So uh, for those younger fans perhaps that uh, don't remember the early um, days where the youth league first kicked off in 2008, you, uh, you were the manager to begin with of that um, in the inaugural uh, youth league team. Um, now we're going to change up the format just a little bit this week. So we're going to do the preview first, Joe, for the Mariners, and then we're going to get into your biographical career. So before any of that happens though, I do want to just put on the record your fantastic achievements with Campbelltown. I know uh, your character well enough to know that you don't like to uh, wholeheartedly take credit for everything, but uh, it is a, a very unique uh, set of success that you've had at Campbelltown. I just want to quickly get into that. So um, your managerial achievements at the club, South Australian NPL Premiers in 2018 and 2019, South Australian NPL Champions in uh, 2013, 2016 and 2018 and also the 2019 National MPL Champions, um, sorry, in 2018. Um, what, what, what a crazy stint you had there. Um, unprecedented success in this state. Um, the club is uh, in a fantastic position even now with you moving on. Um, just briefly touch on, uh, I guess, you know, how, how much it means to you to look back on all that success. Yeah. Um, the club approached me back in 2013. It was their 50th year anniversary. They'd only won one trophy in 50 years. In fact, it was the 1986 Division One Championship. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the late Dave uh, Jenkins was the uh, coach of that team. But it's the only trophy they'd ever, they'd ever won at the top level. Um, so my first question was to them was, you know, did they want to have success? I like being successful. And their answer was yes, they do, and they would do everything they could do to help and support me to achieve that. We won that uh, championship in 2013, um, which was terrific. And then we've had uh, continued success from there. Not every year, uh, there's been little bits of um, peaks and troughs. Uh, the troughs come uh, when you have too many player changes, mm -hmm. and you have player changes as a result of a successful season because ordinarily, um, a good season will have a, a good depth of players that you can choose from for your starting 11. And of course, those players that are in depth that win a championship, they want to play. They want to be a regular first 11 player. So uh, certainly in 2014, after we won it in 2013, and again in, 20, um, in 2017, after we won it in 2016, that happened. We lost you know, good players, good depth, and, uh, and we struggled a little bit uh, just to make finals. But it's been a wonderful journey at Campbelltown. Um, seven years there, uh, four championships, and, uh, and of course uh, the national uh, championship as well, which is uh, which is terrific. 
and uh, I look back on it uh, fondly. But it doesn't work just by having just the coach. You've got to have, of, of course, course, good players. But more so, I think you need to have a, um, a structure in place um, through the board, the committee, that are all going the same direction. And if there's one pulling one way and one pulling the other way, it's never going to work. And um, thankfully for me, uh, over the last seven years, the Campbelltown board, led mainly by uh, Don Lee and Bruno, uh, has kept that uh, really focused. And uh, we've all been had our um, had our um, vision aligned, and that is uh, one of the reasons for the success. And obviously, a great support staff as well. Uh, Phil yeah. Stubbins, former assistant coach of Adelaide United, as well, has been there uh, in 2019. I'm not sure yeah. if he was there before that. No, 2019. Yeah. The reason I brought Phil in, I, I, I knew. Uh, or I had an idea, I've spoken to the club that uh, maybe I did want to have a, a year's break. I haven't had a year off football since uh, even playing, so 30 odd years. Um, and uh, to do a little bit of travelling, of course, in, in Europe uh, when it's warm, it means the Australian winter you've got to go. And uh, that's when the football season's on. So, of course, I brought Phil Stubbins in this year as my assistant as part of a transition or succession plan to take over. That was always the plan and uh, it's worked out well. He's enjoyed the club and what the club stands for and the club have, uh, has enjoyed having him around as well and can see his potential to take the, uh, the, 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 the club to another level now. So um, good luck to him. He's been a good assistant coach, but I've had terrific support staff uh, besides that as well. Vas Pahas was a wonderful assistant and captain for me. And, um, but the players have been, been excellent, led uh, this year by Captain Ian Fife. And um, and the senior players, it's been been terrific. My job's been easy. Brilliant stuff, mate. And obviously, I've got to mention uh, FA Cup appearance in there as well, um, which uh, we're going to interlude back to uh, when we get into talking about your personal biographical uh, interview yep. and your your time in football. But before we do that, we're going to get straight into the preview for Sunday's game. So it's a 5:30 kickoff away to the Mariners this Sunday. And as always, you can watch the game on Fox Sports and the KO Sports app. At the time of filming, we don't have any squad listings. Now, first cap off the rank is the big news earlier this week. Joe of uh, the club's director of football, Ante Kovacevic, departing from his role at the end of 2019. It was a big and somewhat unexpected announcement. Uh, did Ante ever mark you back in the late 90s in the NSL? Presumably, you must have crossed paths at some point in the game. Uh, I think um, very early days of his career was towards the end of mine. So uh, I can remember him being at South Melbourne, in yeah. fact, at, at, at part of that career. Uh, he was a big, burly defender, but he could play. He had good technical ability as well for a defender, um, which they all have these days. But back then, sometimes it was just you know strength and brawn that uh, got them through. But Ante could play. And then, of course, at Melbourne Knights, he was uh, excellent before coming across to, to Adelaide. But, um, yeah, I wish Ante well. He's done a, a good job from what I can gather at Adelaide. I just look at the recruitment uh, in particular and the recruitment um, that he, he put in place when Armour was there, mm -hmm. uh, when they won the championship, probably yep. stands out the most because there was a period in that season, if my memory serves me correctly, where the first... Oh, 10, 12 games, they were struggling. Absolutely, yeah. Went into the January window and got a couple of uh, players. Stephen Moore. Stephen Moore was yeah. one. Uh, there was others yeah. as well, but um, uh, they went on to win the championship. And, and a little bit, you've got to put down to Ante's uh, involvement with that. No, absolutely. Um, now, at the time of filming, we are sweating on Riley McGree's fitness. Uh, he's had a huge start to the season and was clearly missed last time out against the Newcastle Jets. Joey, how crucial is it that he can at least make the bench for Adelaide come Sunday? Uh, it would be a terrific bonus to have Ryan McGree back playing. Is it crucial and critical? No, only because I think they have got a bit of depth. Young Dorigo is doing very well and he can play other players that play in different positions in that role. That We saw that, didn't we, um, in, the, uh, in the last game mm -hmm. they played at, at, at Highmarsh. Um, but to have him in the squad would be would be excellent. Um, but, but I don't think critical. And I think if you rely on one player for your season and, and it becomes crucial or critical, then um, you know it's 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 not a good thing. Yeah, great to have back this week, but uh, critical. No, I think they can still do well uh, without him. Uh, they want to get him right because it's crucial and critical 
that is available for the long term for the rest of the season rather than just one game. So just quickly, uh, if he's not available, who would you play in that sort of 10 role? Would it be Troisi or how would you balance that midfield? I, I think uh, Troisi is the most um, creative yep. uh, midfielder in the squad. Um, I know he's been playing a little bit deeper and a lot of his balls have actually been a little bit longer. Uh, but he's got that short passing game, particularly in the uh, the mid to front third, mm -hmm. that can hurt teams. He's got that um, in his toolkit. Uh, I play yeah, Troisi there as a uh, as a number ten. Beautiful. Um, so Gosford's been a happy hunting ground for us this season, Joe. We've played twice there already and won on both occasions. One being on the back of the uh, FA Cup semi final and also in round six more recently. Um, however, is this a danger game for us considering? how um, effectively the Mariners were able to stifle Sydney FC last weekend, narrowly losing away from home to the champions. Mm. That surprised me against Sydney, that, yeah. they were, that they did stifle them and they did make it difficult for Sydney. I thought after Barbarossa scored, after five minutes, I thought, okay, it's just going to be another um, a a -league squad yeah. uh, versus an NPL squad almost. Um, and it wasn't. And yeah. credit to uh, Stadjic and uh, his Central Coast team for that. But um, I, I can't see, uh, yes it is a bit of a banana skin, I, I, I'm not anticipating that Central Coast can win this game, I, I can only see Adelaide winning, um, I'd be very surprised if, uh, if Central Coast bothered them too much. Okay, interesting. Um, from what you've seen so far this season, how much closer are we to seeing exactly how Gertjan Babak wants to line up and get this team playing stylistically? As there's been a lot of chopping and changing in the early rounds. And there has to have been due to injury, of yeah. course, and uh, loss of uh, the Olympic team players, of mm. course, went across to, uh, to China. Alessandro Turo was one of those. Um, I think it could, uh, he may not get it the same for the whole season. It may take a second year to get that real stability, um, depending, of course, on injury suspensions, etc. I think he's doing a terrific job uh, at the moment. I think uh, you can see when he um, he is disappointed in his team, and they were disappointing against Newcastle, won the game, however. Um, and he came out and he told his team, and it came out in the media that uh, he wasn't happy, and, uh, and, and rightly so. The uh, home game before that against Wellington was exactly the same. So I think he's doing a good job. I think he's going to have to be patient to get that squad how he wants it because of those uh, reasons I've mentioned. But uh, I, I wouldn't fear. I think um, Adelaide United have got depth of good young players. Uh, in fact, the, the second goal they scored against Newcastle Jets, Lockie Brook, came on towards the end. Very influential, wasn't he? Well, he picked up that ball mm. in the uh, when he came on in his in it, deep in his own half. He just started running with it and running at defenders and run past over the halfway line. I think it went out for a throw and we scored from that or Adelaide scored from that. But that was positive play. So they've got good young players that uh, can be positive, proactive in their approach rather than just, uh, I better be safe, ball sideways or ball sat, uh, backwards. No, and this Lockie Brook did it, and I think there's more Lockie Brooks in the squad than uh, just him. Hopefully uh, it's not too far away from seeing us unlock all of their potential. Um, now, conversely, how impressed have you been by the Mariners recruiting for the current campaign? They've brought in names like Mark Birgitti, who I'm sure you would have worked with back in the day here and, uh, and there, and as well as the likes of Milan Juric and Ziggy Gordon. Jacob Melling's been there a while, but uh, he's another one you would have overseen earlier in the decade when you were at Adelaide United. Um, yeah, overall, yeah. what's your thoughts on their uh, For me, I think um, Urich and Birigetti have been their, their, their best signings, Absolutely. their best uh, um, people that they brought into the squad. Birigetti, they needed somebody, the, the back end goals that could make those crucial saves, he can do that. And he wants to prove people wrong uh, at other clubs at the moment, so he's driven really driven. Eurish has come on, uh, in from uh, overseas and of course scored some good goals uh, in a team that doesn't score a lot of goals. He's scored goals uh, from distance and also within mm. the box which is good. Uh, but I think the best bit of recruitment they've done is brought in a, a good coach, uh, yep. Stadzic. I'm not saying the others weren't good coaches but uh, I think Stadzic um, has passion for football and passion to play uh, proactive football. You can see that the way they play Although against Sydney last week they had to set up differently and they did tighten up and that's what made it hard for Sydney. But I think that there's been uh, the club's 
best recruitment piece has been the, the Stadjic uh, appointment as a coach, but I think Birgetti and Urich have been, uh, been excellent. Of course, Sajid is another one that uh, has a lot to prove, but uh, yeah. I'm sure back in the day you would have seen that hunger that Mark Birgitte has. Very unlucky to have had someone like Eugene Kolegovic ahead of him twice at two yeah. different clubs yeah. in his career, but uh, you would have seen him in his youngest days. Um, well, I went to the AIS, in fact, to see my son and my nephew who were there uh, back in 2005 or six, whenever it was now, and Birgitte was one of the goalkeepers okay. there. And I came back and uh, and called Aurelio Vidmar and said, Vidi, you need to have a look at this uh, this young keeper. And uh, and Vidi did bring him in. And uh, he played a lot of youth team football when I was the first youth team coach for Adelaide United. And uh, he's a terrific kid, lovely, lovely boy, great character. He's a winner. Um, and uh, I think he has got points to prove. So I know you're not going to admit it, but does Mark Birgitte have to credit you for his career? <laughs> no, no, no one credits. No, no, not not one bit. Um, well, you know how it goes in football, though, Joe. Like you need an opportunity. You need that break. Yeah, you need an opportunity, and um, uh, but he was always going to get an opportunity because okay. he was good yeah. enough. There's no doubt. Sydney, Melbourne, Perth, where we, he was from. Prodigious. In, in fact, Perth uh, would have liked to have him as well. Um, but no, he came to Adelaide. No, he doesn't need to thank me. He's uh, done everything himself. He's a good boy. Fair enough, mate. I, I was expecting to get that kind of response. Uh, now, can you tell us whether you've uh, got any standout memories of your time coaching on and away to Angosford at all? Yeah, we had a terrific youth team. Yep. Um, well, either or. Yeah, uh, in Gosford, um, w we played a, a game in Gos Gosford against uh, Central Coast Mariners in the youth team, I think it was the inaugural season, and, and Central Coast that year were uh, had quite a strong squad. Okay. But we went there that day, and uh, we had one of those days out where everything went well. We ended up winning the game 6-0, which was, you know, back then, that that was a, a, a huge score. It is today, of course, but it was uh, unusual back mm. then. And um, yeah, the players just love the ground, the surroundings, the, uh, the, the, the drive from Sydney down or up to uh, Central Coast is just all scenic, you know, down by the ocean and big cliffs and rocks there. Really good. It, it was just a, a wonderful uh, uh, game, 6-0. There you go. Very uh, huge scoreline there. Did uh, Francesco Monterosso get on the score sheet? I can't. I can't remember the goal scorer on that day, but a bit far back. But he was uh, prolific for you, though. He was prolific. Yeah. He was. He was excellent, Frankie. Um, you know, his big size, twelve boots, and um, he used to score goals for fun, uh, Frankie Monterosso. In fact, he got a A League uh, contract. Yeah, he did. Uh, in the end, but um, of course, he's ch chosen other pathways uh, to go down. He's a very smart, very academic boy. And um, he uh, was going into law or, or something like that. So that was his chosen career and good luck to him. Yeah, absolutely. Good luck to him. Uh, now, we've seen over the past fortnight celebrations kicking off for the past decade of Adelaide United's existence as a club, which you yourself, of course, have featured in prominently. Now, I'm interested in the kind of names who, in your opinion, would have to take up a spot in our team's uh, starting 11 over the past decade. I know I'm putting you on the yeah. spot here, but uh, I, I'm not saying name an entire starting 11, but some of the, the nucleus of it, who would you say has to be issue in? Oh, you look at the back uh, with Galakovic. I think yeah. Galakovic is the, the goalkeeper. He just, throughout the, uh, particularly the Asian Champions League campaigns, which I was involved in one, he was superb. So he'd be my goalkeeper. Um, and then he looked through the back. Uh, I think Sasha Ogonowski came here to prove a point. In fact, left Adelaide and went to Asia, went to Korea and uh, became uh, an Asian champion. Yeah. Uh, an Asian uh, player of the year. year. Yeah. So uh, Ogonowski would be there at the back. I think Cassio uh, has been a, was a terrific inclusion, not just as a footballer, but as a character and as a person around the, the club. So he would be in there. I think the best number six. Um, ever brought to the club has been Asayas. Yeah, uh, no one will disagree with that. <laughs> yeah, ter terrific player, not just uh, control the game, uh, but um, he um, he just he could play and he could uh, help his, his teammates enormously. So Asayas would be up there. Um, I like Serge Van Dyke as a number nine. I know sometimes he didn't play under Cozzy in particular uh, as much as what he probably could have done, but I thought he was a, a really, really good player. And then out wide, you've got, yeah, and I'm just going off the top of my head now, you know, wingers such as Travis Stodd um, was, uh, was was excellent. Lucas Pantelis on the left-hand side 
was uh, was good as well. Um, so, uh, and then I look in behind them, and I'm thinking now attacking or creative midfielders. Troyes is a good player, of course, but I think uh, for the club, um, both Karuska and probably Marcos Flores had good parts there. So um, they would be certainly uh, some of that you'd uh, you'd think about having in there. Um, I feel like I have to throw Craig Goodwin's name in there. Yeah, Craig Goodwin. <laughs> and, and again, Craig Goodwin, good left uh, left side player. Yeah. Can play at the back, can play in a wide five. He can play uh, as a left winger as well. Craig Goodwin's been been excellent for the club. You'd uh, at the very least find a way to shoot on him in, I'm assuming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he'd definitely be in. He'd be in. Beautiful stuff, mate. Uh, now, that pretty much brings us to the end of the preview. So I'm going to take you all the way back, Joe, to the very beginning. And uh, I'm going to ask you uh, what it was like having been born and raised in Adelaide at a time when the sport was truly a game for migrants. Uh, we're talking sort of early 70s here when you would have been... Uh, uh, you know, running around with the football. Um, what was it like to grow up in a town where the game had little to no infrastructures in place whatsoever to support the ambitions of young footballers? Obviously, a moment in time that we're planets away from in today's world. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. My parents were ten pound palms. They came out from Middlesbrough in England, where we were born, but I was only a seven-year-old. So mm-hmm. all of my football has been taught and learned and played in Australia. Um, Came out and I, I do remember um, as a seven-year-old playing my first club, which was for the school team, St Augustine's in Salisbury. And um, the football, the school oval was a football oval, had football, of course, uh, no yeah. soccer goals, had football posts. And um, there was one, two, there was two teams. Uh, I think it was an under nines and an under 11s. That was it. And um, yeah, there was no infrastructure at all. We had a good coach, Mr. Frank Winstanley, I remember uh, him. And um, we just played football. The lucky thing about St. Augustine's was they were in an association that was very much football driven with good infrastructure. And that was the Elizabeth and Districts uh, JSA, our Junior Soccer Association. And Elizabeth and Districts um, did some excellent things in terms of um, Organising games and leagues, etc. It was a fantastically run competition, okay. and um, and it, it, that there's where I learnt my uh, my football. Uh, Dad, of course, became the coach because he came from England and football was in his blood. And um, but again, just uh, we were the minority uh, at that time. Um, it very much is something I'd liken to the Anthos Coglu story because he always talks about how he, his school team did, had to play in football, as in Australian rules football, Guernseys yes, and things yeah. like that. I'm sure you, you know there's a lot to relate to there. Earliest days, you know, it was a migrants game, really. It definitely was, but it's the migrants that made it so good, and yeah. it's the migrants that we can thank for for today. And I'm not just talking about the English being mine, but uh, you know, you look at the the local league now, and then back in the even in the uh, the late seventies and the early eighties, when I started coming through as a senior player, you know the Croatian teams, the Serbian teams, the Greek teams, they were just uh, you know fantastic. And uh, can't forget the Italians. And, 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 and I was going to get to the Italian, <laughs> and, and then, the, the, then the Adelaide cities and the Azuris yeah. and the Campbell towns and um, uh, these sorts of clubs, they just made it fantastic. So, Absolutely. And those migrants, uh, they have laid the foundations for what we're enjoying today. Yeah, the influence is still there today. Yes. 100% shines yes. through. Um, so, uh, yeah, very fascinating to hear about that. So after first cutting your teeth in football to senior level with Para Hills, um, you joined Adelaide City in 1983, where you would remain a one-club player for your entire senior career, going on to achieve legendary status as one of the club's greatest ever strikers, along with Damien Murray, after you'd netted 75 goals in 334 games. What a return that is at a semi-professional level. To couple that, you were also at the club during its most successful ever period, having played there throughout each and every one of the club's NSL titles. If you can find a way, Joe, can you sum up your time at City over the length of your entire career? Well, a, a lot to yeah. sum up, obviously. But well, people say you know, um, you know, uh, you know, the, the game owes you. The game owes me nothing. I owe the game so much because during that time, I've made so many friends, met so many people, travelled the world with the game, um, and the time with Adelaide City five NSL Grand Finals, which we won three, two Cups, National Cups, 
that uh, I played in. The Cubs has actually won three national cups, but I, I was involved with only two of them. Um, just unbelievable um, times. But the, is the people, the way we played football, I remember the late Les Murray describing Adelaide City, the way we played as the most idealistic, idealistic way the game could be played in Australia. That was in the, uh, in the late 80s and mm -hmm. it was good football we everyone knew what was uh, what was happening on the ground but we had some great players as well good good teams you know Ivanovic, Tobin at the back, Shilabir, uh, the Vidmar, oh, the names of Elta, Charlie Villani, Steve Maxwell um, these players were just uh, excellent and then of course the next breed came in or the next generation which was your Veers, your Damien Morris, uh, Ernie Tapai, Scott Lozanowski's these sorts of players then at the back, we've also had great goalkeepers. Uh, William McNally was uh, the first one I played with. Um, never played for the national team, but then all the ones after did. You know, the Petkovic, Jason Petkovic, Robbie Zabika. Uh, we've had some fantastic, uh, fantastic players. And it, like Campbelltown as well, the club, um, you felt part of a club. It wasn't just a team you played for, you actually played for a club. And back then in the old NSL, similar to the way the Adelaide United players would feel today, we, we were representing the state almost. So there's that sense of pride and um, the players felt that and knew that and worked towards um, not letting people down in that regard as well. So yeah, great times, uh, some terrific derbies against the other National Soccer League team from Adelaide in, in that era, which was West Adelaide Hellas. And, um, they uh, yeah, just some terrific memories and met some great people. Firstly, on that point, um, if you go back and look at some archives, uh, you won't see Cooper Stadium pumping yeah. like it was back yeah. in those days, uh, particularly those derbies against West Adelaide. And the other point I want to raise, having briefly been at Adelaide City, I, I was uh, invited to go into the, uh, the Oakton rooms by Adriano Pellegrino on one occasion and it's like stepping back in time. Yeah. Um, such celebrated history and you almost feel like, uh, you know, they, how did they only win three? Yeah. You know, like it's, it's incredible. Yeah, it's, uh, it is and I think uh, full credit to the club, they've got that room there at Oakton and there is a lot of trophies in there, there is a lot of um, photographs and uh, I think it's, uh, I think it's, I think it's brilliant. Well, uh, your time at City extends beyond just being a player, obviously. So following your uh, playing career, you, uh, you coached there for three seasons uh, before moving across the border into Victoria, uh, where you managed a host of clubs. But uh, with Graham Gully, you won the NPL Victoria title. Uh, and then having come back to South Australia, you acknowledged as a recipient of the 2005 FFSA Award of Distinction um, before coaching the Croydon Kings in 2005. And then in 2008, uh, you were headhunted for the position as Adelaide United's inaugural youth team coach. Uh, you had an absolutely outstanding time in charge of our youth team, finishing second in the competitions made in year, made the grand final that year as well, unluckily losing out to Sydney here in Adelaide. Uh, and then you finished third the following two seasons after that. Uh, before you moved on from that role. So firstly, Joe, I'd like to hear about your time as the youth team coach specifically, and then about your time at Adelaide United in general, given the significance of your involvement in the first team pertaining to your level of qualifications when it came to the Asian Championship. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the youth league was a terrific opportunity. I knew that uh, the role was coming up, and um, what actually happened was that um, um, I was coaching Croydon. I'd come back from Melbourne halfway through the year and I took over Croydon. If you don't mind me just quickly butting in, what was uh, the move to Victoria about? Did, just just yeah. more opportunities? It was, it, was, it was work, so I okay. worked for AGC Finance at the time right, right. and I was transferred from my current state sales manager role into managing a, the Victorian consumer division for consumer finance. Right. So it was a work uh, career move. Uh, but of course, on the back of that, again, just like now, part time, I went straight back into football coaching. Of course. So I started with first of all with uh, the old Brunswick Juventus or Bulleen, as they are known now. Had four and uh, four years there before moving on to to Green Gully, where we won the uh, came top in 20, 2003 and then uh, won the Doherty Cup there as well. But came back uh, with Croydon, and then after uh, with Croydon, I knew the job was coming up with that Legend United, so I finished there after a year and a half. And then the job with Adelaide United did come up, and fond memory, loved it. Loved the trying to 
teach young players what I've known when you travel um, interstate to mm -hmm. play games of football because every second game of course we're playing away we're traveling interstate how to prepare yourself etc interesting that first year in the national youth league because we could only have 12 contracted players and those 12 contracted players had to include of course a goalkeeper so you had one substitute and the 12 contracted players had to be born between a five-year span so we had to think about okay who's the first team got who they got surplus that may want to come down and play youth league and so not necessarily all the best players came into that squad and that was like that for the first two or three years so it was a balancing act between huge constraints yeah right? huge constraints and in fact when we traveled you might ask well what did you use for substitutes if uh, the a-league squad didn't give us any of their players to come down then we'd go to the AIS and the Institute would give us players. Just one off basis players. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And they do that with um, with all of their, 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 their scholarship holders. So that is how it worked. A terrific time. It was a terrific job with the uh, Youth League because we trained um, four times a week, plus played on the weekend. We, uh, it was all part time, but um, we, we did all that and um, the players that uh, got an opportunity to play, they, they loved it because they were getting football during the summer and they were playing with local clubs during the winter. Yeah. It was just fantastic, really, really good. And a real family environment, because I even remember being a maybe 12, 13, listening to Fresh FM and there were times where you were uh, commentating, I think, with Dom Ronaldo and, yeah. um, you know, just, it felt like a real family club, obviously, um, you know, you'd give inside scoops on, you know, the training schedules and things like that. and. Just the transparency and the fact that, uh, you know, it was a little bit pre, um, you know, this elite sort of professionalism yeah. that was going on and, uh, you know, it was always a bit more accessible back in the day. Um, and yeah, you were obviously there in that time. So. My one objective that I wanted to achieve being a youth league coach was to try to make if a player went from me in the youth team to the first team, either to play or to train even, to make up numbers that the transition would be seamless. So the same words were spoken, the same, uh, if, there was, if it was a right fullback, he knew what to expect. Um, and that there was my number one objective. And by having that, that in place, uh, we got some terrific results as well, which was the outcome, uh, the final outcome, but the focus was on uh, always improving the player. Now let's hear about uh, this little known fact that a lot of us um, were, you know, very intrigued by at the time, but maybe people don't remember so much now, but Asian Champions League yeah. 2010, it wasn't the first time it happened either, uh, but uh, Aurelio Vidmay didn't have the qualifications he needed to be listed as the first team coach on paper. That's right. So uh, obviously you were given that title, um, given you had the, uh, the necessary qualifications. Um, the AFC Champions League in 2010? Yeah, brilliant. It was uh, my most, um, I was, and I've never ever been full-time in football, um, but I had three months there where I virtually went almost full-time, whereby um, in finance at that time, the GFC was just hitting, so yeah, I could afford absolutely. more time uh, away from work. Um, but I had the Asian A license at the time, and you needed a minimum Asian A license to coach of course. a team in the Asian Champions League. That now, uh, you, today, you actually need a pro diploma, which I've also also got. But uh, Vidi didn't quite have his A license, so from a pure technical point of view, um, they needed an, another coach. So I was the youth league coach at the time. I had the qualification, so I was uh, put in as the uh, as the head coach. I did all the things such that all the the official things such yeah. as the uh, the media conferences, uh, etc. And but make no mistake, Vidi was still the coach at the time, and he ran the yeah. sessions. But to his credit, and this is why I loved it so much, I was brought into the um, first team setup. I was on the ground at the training. I was uh, involved, and he made me involved. But he did run it, and he did uh, he was the coach, and there was no no mistakes about that. But all the official uh, duties uh, was done by, by myself. I did all the travelling with the team, of course, uh, as well. So I had three months, almost been a full-time coach, and uh, enjoyed it immensely. I love those kinds of stories. I'm fairly certain it's not the only time that it happened either. I'm pretty sure under Cosmina's reign, because he didn't have the necessary qualifications either. Someone else 
one of the assistants uh, was again made officially the head coach at the time. But uh, my question was going to become, did anyone ever gloss over what the alternative would have been if you weren't around? <laughs> Uh, I didn't ask them. Would, would have been a bit sticky to us. Yeah, I, I didn't ask them, but they would have. Um, there would have been a little bit of a predicament, I, I dare say. But um, no, I don't know what their contingency plan was, uh, Ellis. <laughs> Very interesting. Um, so, uh, moving forward, uh, Joe, after your time with Adelaide United, where uh, you had a lot of great experiences, um, you were uh, appointed as a Campbelltown City coach. In 2013, we've uh, sort of glossed over it briefly, but um, you know what, what a fantastic position this club now is in at Steve Woodcock Sports Centre. Um, you speak to anyone around the local grounds in the NPL, they'll all tell you that uh, they want to get to where Campbelltown is, not just in terms of how things are running on the park, but also off it. Um, you know, <laughs> I don't really know what question I'm trying to ask, but basically. Um, you, you know, you've overseen all that success at Campbelltown um, and there's a culture in place there, dare I say now, and uh, surely you must be confident it'll, it'll uh, you know, go on to continue yeah. to bring in major trophies. Well, I am confident that it will uh, for two reasons. Well, actually three reasons. The first reason is the board is still stable and um, committed and focused, so the stability within the board, there's no... I certainly don't see any in, in, in fighting, um, and it's got a terrific junior base. So it's uh, it's got solid foundations, and it's been well governed and been well run. That's number one. Secondly, we've got a um, uh, the squad from last year. Yeah, we lost uh, two players. Our campaign lost two players: Anthony Toure uh, to Adelaide City and Brendan Santafanti. Um, both didn't play as regularly as what they would have liked last year. So they've gone to get first uh, eleven team football. Uh, elsewhere and you can't blame them for that but the rest of all stay which means again you've got stability the second foundation of success is uh, there with the planning group and thirdly um, with uh, Phil Stubbins now taking over he's got a it's not brand new for him he knows yeah. how the club works he's got a feeling for uh, what makes the players tick he's got a feeling uh, or an understanding of how to drive different players differently to get the optimum performance out of them so uh, I think for those three reasons, there's no reason why success can't continue. Um, success might not be just winning trophies though, success might be getting a young player within the squad and getting them to an Adelaide United as an example. That is, for me, that would be a success uh, indicator, but um, uh, I think uh, I wish them all the well, uh, all, all the, the best of luck in the, in the world. They're a terrific, they are a terrific club. They've found their way and uh, now they've just got to keep navigating it and sustain it. Melbourne City came out and said you were the best NPL club they'd seen across the entire country. This is a club owned by the biggest football consortium ownership group in the world. Um, that speaks volumes, obviously. I think, you know, as a, as a part-time coach, that must be one of the isolated things that you just sit back and think, well, it's all worth it when you hear something like that. Yeah, we lost the game 3-1 against them, although the third goal we, we hit on the break, we were pushing to get a, a, a result and we were left on, on the break. But uh, Would you agree though that people don't, literally don't remember the loss in yeah, that game? Yeah, it, it was just I a spectacle. <laughs> I, I remember the, the loss, but I also took take out the positives and that night we were good. We, yeah. well, we, we played well, we, we played uh, well enough I think to get a result. Um, and I, I know he won't mind me saying this, but Nick Harper's in our goal um, that night, it wasn't, uh, wasn't, it wasn't his best night. Um, and I reckon if, uh, it, and their goalkeeper had a blinder, yeah. bizarre second yeah. goal, he, he made two or three really good saves. So um, I think on another night, it would have, uh, could have been different, but it, it just showed our players, and I think not only our, our club, but Olympic did well as well, and it showed other coaches and other players, I hope other players in the National Premier League in South Australia, that there is a bridge that they can climb to play at that level because we uh, we were close to Melbourne City that day and uh, I dare say if we'd have won it, uh, the game, we could have gone on a little nice. further. But uh, I was proud of the way of our performance. We didn't sit back. We had a go with the risk of you know being being caught and um, and conceding goals. But uh, for me, it didn't it didn't matter. It was about playing football, 
good, attractive football. We had over 3,000 people come. They don't want to see us just come and defend. Uh, uh, no, result. of course not. No, just, uh, just go for it. And that we did. So I was proud of the players. And uh, yeah, to get some of the uh, compliments from their coaching staff in particular um, was, yeah, it was nice. And obviously, uh, it was highly influential to the uh, the FFA appointing um, another ro- another allocation, sorry, yeah, right. to South Australia, yeah. uh, which you know we've been crying out to see. Um, yeah. And so now there will be three teams, I believe, going into the competition as of next season from South Australia, Adelaide United, plus two from the yeah. Member Federation, yeah. which is fantastic. Uh, the other things I want to touch on, Joe, can't. You know, can't um, sort of not acknowledge the fact that Campbelltown, for everything it's been successful in, also may potentially become a breeding ground for young prospective coaches because obviously Phil Stubbins, huge experience there, who's coming in to replace you. Um, I had Ian Fife sitting where you are recently. He said he's keen to coach soon as well and at least be a part of the setup splitting his time up between playing and coaching and then obviously we've seen Vas Pahas who um, was under you uh, f- you know for a long yeah. period of Campbelltown yeah. now be appointed at West Adelaide as their head coach so it's almost like the Hawthorne yeah. equivalent yeah. from the AFL isn't it? And Joe Lagana, uh, my first uh, assistant 13 and 14 he's now at Fulham and, and coaching there which is terrific to see as well Joe Lagana was my captain at Croydon brought him through as my first assistant coach at Campbelltown, and Vas Pahas, of course. Ian Fife's gone from playing, he's now Phil Stubbins assistant. Okay. Uh, been officially appointed, so he's starting his journey as a So he's coach. not going to be running around anymore? He's not, uh, no, he, uh, he's oh, okay. an assistant coach uh, for Campbelltown uh, for this season coming out. Okay. And wish him well. Beautiful, mate. Now, before we let you get out of here, Joe, because I know you're an extraordinarily busy guy, um, we've got, firstly, a fan question in from Darren Clark, who asks, and I know you're going to play this with a straight bat, but he asks, has Campbelltown City, with your help, become the biggest club in South Australia? Oh, well, I think Adelaide United is the biggest club, professionally, of course. So, talking uh, semi-professional. Yeah, semi-professional. I, I, think, um, I think they're amongst it. Yeah. But I wouldn't, as soon as you blink or you take your eyes off the road you're on, uh, there's other clubs out there doing really, really well as well. I mean, you look at Metro Stars. Adelaide City's had a little bit of a uh, misfortune over the last uh, 12 months, we know that. But Adelaide City are a very good club also. Uh, so there's other good clubs out there. Are we the uh, uh, at the forefront? At the moment, with the trophies that they have won, um, you would like to think so. But uh, as soon as you, like I say, blink or take your eye off the road, another club will take us over, so it'll take over. So I think that we're, uh, the, the club's doing all things right, as best they can. Beautiful, and just lastly, Joe, um, we can't not acknowledge the fact that uh, you're the football pioneer in the famous Mullen family tree. Uh, it's a surname that means a lot for the game in the state. You're obviously a father to Daniel Mullen, who is a legend of the club and an Asian Champions League winner and the nephew of Matthew Mullen, who also got on the park at a senior level in an Adelaide United strip, and Alex Mullen, who played senior A-League football with Sydney FC, also his nephew. Um, surely this is something special for you to look back on every here and now. When you get that one yeah. minute when you're overseas yeah. in the winter months. Yeah, it, it is. I've loved my time being able to see my nephews, Matthew and Alex, um, at training and playing, you know, four times a week, where ordinarily I wouldn't have had that chance to do it if I wasn't their coach. They're both playing for you. Uh, Campbelltown. Were playing yeah, for you, yeah. Campbelltown, and they're yeah. there this year again for next season. As well as Daniel. Daniel. Yeah, as well as Daniel, which is which is good. I've got another son, Michael, who, uh, my belief, surveyor one, uh, he could have been the best. Uh, of the lot. Yeah, but he liked the social activities. Okay. He now plays at. Um, Brahma Lodge, and he won the Amateur League Player of the Season. Ambitious little club, aren't they? The yeah, they are. So, uh, but he um, he does that because he works two weeks on and two weeks off okay. in in the mines, so he can't uh, train regularly. And then I've got another nephew, Isaac Mullen, playing for um, Para Hills. Seventeen-year-old uh, Isaac. He had a terrific uh, season last year. In fact. Uh, I was so surprised he won the Power Hills Player of the Year, the Supporters Player of the Year, the Players Player of the Year and um, uh, and the Coaches Award. So he's had a good season, good player. Um, I'm proud of all of them. They've, uh, they've done really, really well. Mate, surely, I mean, with all 
do seriousness um, when everyone's got a, a bit of time on their hands, a seven aside team, surely, yeah. <laughs> led by you, surely, uh, you know, it's not, not the worst call. Well, <laughs> um, yes, we could do that. I don't think I'll be able to play though. I'd have to do just shout instructions. So. Uh, you're in good yeah, physical yeah, condition, yeah. mate. I'm sure you could lead the line. <laughs> Thank you. Now, uh, Joe Mullen, uh, it's it's hard to sum you up really, just so many connections to Adelaide United, but obviously uh, your legacy in football goes far beyond Adelaide United. Um, it's been absolutely a privilege to get you in here, mate. Um, you've got a bit of time now to just look on from the sides. I'm sure you're enjoying that prospect of uh, not having that, you know, subtle pressure. I know, I know you you know, you're not someone that's uh, daunted by pressure, but obviously now just being able to enjoy the game, watch your family play, uh, various family members obviously like we've just yeah. heard, and uh, and just enjoy, uh, you know, being around the scene. I'm sure it's something you're really embracing, uh, but obviously you're very busy in the meantime, yeah. working full time. Uh, so grateful to get you in the studio, mate. All the very best with everything, and um, thank you for uh, all of your services. No, it's been a pleasure. Like I said to you before, I owe this game so much and uh, the people involved with the game uh, so much. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's been a terrific ride and um, I wish, uh, certainly wish uh, Adelaide United all the best over this festive season. It's an important part of the year, starting with, of course, the game against Central Coast um, on Sunday. And, um, yeah, hopefully the, uh, the game of football in South Australia continues to, uh, to get better and better. Mate, pleasure chatting with you. All the very best. No and uh, we'll certainly hear from you soon, I'm sure. Thanks, Ellis. Thanks, Joe. Cheers, mate.